Good evening, brothers and sisters. I trust the day has been a great one for you. And I'm wondering if you were jigging in the background like I was listening to that song. It's been a while since we've heard that, but the words are still real. So, another evening for our Bible study. And I'm really looking forward to this evening session. Now, last week, we had some keywords in that session. And the keywords were speaking and walking with wisdom. And this week, our keyword is submission and humility. So welcome to the series, another Bible study in the series, a letter from James, a guide to spiritual maturity. And I, for one, I'm really looking forward to what our presenter has to give this evening. Now, to, before we give, begin, I want to ask Sister Selina Tapu from the Church of St. John to bring the session to the Lord in prayer. Sister Selina, your turn. Good evening, everyone. Let us approach the throne of grace. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are the creator and master of the universe, of the galaxies, and yet you are also our compassionate and benevolent father in the awesome mystery of your threefold personality in the Holy Trinity. Help us this evening to open our hearts to you, to so humble ourselves before you that we can truly hear you speaking to us individually through the words of our Bible study such that we each, we each can take away that most important lesson meant for us. That lesson which we need to learn in order to grow spiritually, to learn submission, to learn humility, so that over time, through the constant practice of our faith, we may in truth become doers and not only hearers of your word. This evening, as we bring ourselves to you and our hearts to hear and learn, we pray through the merciful mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the prayerful support of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you very much for that powerful prayer, Selena. And it just sets the tone for this evening's Bible study. Thank you very much. Now, as we prepare to hear and to receive the word, I want us to listen to this next song that says, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Because a lot of times we get bogged down in situations and we totally forget that we have this privilege to call upon the Lord for help. And so I want you to listen carefully to the words of this song and follow along if you can. I'm 
wake up in the morning. I thank God for the blessings of the day. Then I ask the Lord to give me the strength to keep me going, and I ask Him to take me to where I should be. Help me, Lord, as I come to do Your will. Help me, Lord, keep me under Your wings. Help me, Lord, and lead me to Your way. Help me, Lord, every moment, every day. As I travel on this road and on every journey, I may stumble in the darkness of the night. But I cry to the Lord to give me the courage to rise again, and I ask Him to take me back to His kingdom of love. Yes, and so I say, help us, Lord, to do your will every day, every day. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we now come we're to the part where I introduce the speaker, the presenter, who is no other than Mr. Donovan Reed, and I'm going to call him Brother Donovan. For the benefit of those who don't know Brother Donovan, he worships at the Church of Transfiguration. And he's deeply a part of this Bible study. And he is, he is happily married with children and one precious granddaughter, who I know he cherishes very much. And so, Brother Danny, I welcome you. So, Brother Danny, over to you. Thank you, Sister. Zaki, thank you so much. Brothers and sisters, friends all, it's a pleasure to be with you once again, sharing in Bible study. And before we begin to break God's word, may we just have a brief word of prayer. 
shall we? Father, as we sit around your word, may it be a lamp to our feet and a light to our hearts. We ask, Lord, that you break your word, may it minister to us, and may it be unto us, Lord, spirit and life. As we come to stand to you now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we have been going through the, the letter from James. And we have been having a wonderful time. Tonight we'll be looking at chapter four. And the study is entitled Lessons in Submission and Humility. Lessons in Submission and Humility. I want to start off by just touching on the major points in this chapter. The chapter starts out with an examination of the human condition. And it also looks at the drivers, the causes, and the source of the human condition and the problems that we experience on a regular basis. But happily, the chapter ends with looking at the role of submission and humility in restoring the human condition. It's a wonderful chapter and it's the penultimate chapter. And I think it sets up the entire letter for the final chapter that we will look at next week. So these are the three major points. And I want us to, before we look at the chapter, I want us to just consider the human condition. And of course, you know, I like an interactive by the study. So I want to ask, can anyone describe the human condition? And I'm going to give you a little bit of a hint. Just think of the daily news or the nightly news. So, would anyone want to share their description of the human condition as this? And I've given you a, a little hint. The nightly news or the morning or the morning news. Um, Brother Donovan, I think I'm going to start the ball a rolling. Mm -hmm. And the human condition is the very reason why I don't watch the news. It is too much negative, too much violence, a total disregard for human life, a selfish position. And it happens at all levels of society and all age groups, adult age groups. And as I said, for this very reason, I do not watch the news or listen to the news. So I, I ask my husband to filter it and just give me the essentials. Thank you, Sister Jackie. I, I think you have hit the nail on the head. Many of our colleagues feel the same way. And I would want to say, if we were to describe the human condition, we would use words like quarrels, fights and conflicts, murders, and oh my God, the situation in Jamaica is distressing. And of course, if we look internationally, then we use the word wars. We just have to look at the Israeli Hamas situation. We have to look at the Ukraine, Russia situation. We have to look at Yemen and the Hutu rebels. The human condition, my brothers and sisters, sorry to say, we live in a broken world. And the words like these summarize the human and describe the human condition. Conflicts, violence, and wars. But interesting, this chapter, chapter four, 
in the letter of James, or the book of James. It looks and it starts with looking at the sources, the causes, and the main drivers of the human condition of this broken world that we all call home. And so, as we begin with the Apostle James, as he wrote chapter 4, I'm going to put the verse up on the screen. The first two verses from the New American Standard Bible. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is the source not your pleasures that wage war in your bodies? Parts you lost and do not have. So you commit murder and you are envious and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. There's chapter four, chapter four, verses one to two. Brothers and sisters, we're going to see how we can unpack this chapter. And I'm hoping to learn from you. So I'm going to be asking questions, and they are not rhetorical questions. You'll notice that the Apostle Paul, the Apostle James, that he described three causes, three sources, three drivers of the human condition. And he used three different words, and they're all in red. And the words are pleasures, lust, and the word envious. And in the original language, the Apostle James used three different words. No, they are they have identified three causes of the human condition. I want to hear from you now. How, what is your understanding of the first cause, the first source of co conflicts and quarrels? And he describes that as pleasures that wage war in our body parts. Could someone, and no answer is a silly answer. What do you think the Apostle James? Um, I'm going to just read Beverly Young's comment in the chat, which I think will address your first question. And she says, the human condition is one of self-serving, lawless desires, all for himself or herself. All right. Thank you very, very much. Pleasures, pleasures. I'm going to, and I thank you for that. And I think our sister has probably um, moved also to the second driver. But I'm going to explain the apostle's use of the word pleasures. Surprisingly, the root word for pleasures is the same word that we have in English called hedonism. Hedonism. And one of our all-inclusive hotels has taken that name. And the, the word hedonism, which your apostle James was looking at here when he used the word pleasures, is really the pursuit of sensual pleasure over everything else. In other words, where we have a mindset where pleasure becomes our God. This is the first driver, the first source, the first cause of the broken human condition that the Apostle James has identified, hedonism. And that's why the word is translated in the New American Standard Bible correctly as pleasures, pursuing central pleasure over everything else. But he used another word to describe another driver and our sister, our sister Jackie, read from the um, chat, she used the word lust. You lust and do not have. This one, I think, should be, um, and I'd like to hear from someone. How would you de define this word lust as a driver of the human condition? You have to put it in simpler terms. I know Jackie. 
read from the chat, but I just wanted to hear from someone um, if you would describe this source, this cause of conflict. And in fact, you lost and do not have, so you commit murder? I think, you know, lust can be described in many ways, but one of the ways in which it can be described is as very strong sexual desires. This is the term that is used in the dictionary. And um, so, you know, it, it can tie in also to the previous um, word of pleasures and the hedonism and the lustful sexual pleasures of man. And so when we sin against our bodies, that is, you know, that is the one sin through through sexual desires where we can where we sin against our own body. Um, and so, you know, when when we can't control these urges, these these desires, um, it, like you said, or as it is presented here, you know, it causes us to do very heinous things when that cannot be controlled. So that's my perspective. Thank you, my sister Donna. And interestingly enough, the word lost here is a neutral word. It, it really means desire, neutral word. But in this context, and um, in this context, the word lost really means desire out of control, desire out of control, and not just just for sexual things. It can be for someone else's property. And that's why you'll find that when it comes on to estate and someone's will, you find a lot of murders are committed because people lost after not just the flesh now, but the lust of the eyes, the lust after what people have. So in this case, in this context, thank you, Donna. But in this case, the word lost means what you are saying, but it has a wider meaning. It means desire out of control. And the third one, envious. I think that one is fairly easy. Envy as another driver of the human condition is wanting, forgetting what others have. So my brothers and sisters, the Apostle James has identified three causes, three sources, three drivers of the human condition. Hedonism, pursuing pleasure as a God over everything else. Lust, desire out of control. And thirdly, envy, coveting and wanting what others have. Let us move on as he looks at the human condition in, I'm sorry that it says James 1, it's James 4. And he says, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend what you request on your pleasures. Brothers and sisters, the Apostle James here is identifying some more causes, some more drivers of the human condition. Can anyone share with us what you see here as a driver, as a cause? You do not. I see Marcia, you have your hand raised. Thank you, Marcia. Okay, good night. So the first part you do not have because you do not ask. And I think of pride, um, keeping one from asking. And then you ask and do not receive because you do not uh, you ask the wrong motive. So the first part, pride keeps us away. And the second, selfishness, because even if we ask, it's about self. It is to gratify um, the self. It's, it, it's, it's self-serving. And, and so... Um, and you see, follows up. So you may spend what you request on your pleasure. So it's about self um, to the, 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 the um, exclusion of all else. It's, there's no um, interest in sharing or um, doing for others. So first pride, then selfishness. That's how I see it. Amen. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sister Marcia. And I would possibly add another flavor to it and describe it this way. You do not have because you do not ask. And Sister Marcia says, here is that level of pride. And that is true. And we could also say it another way by calling it prayerlessness. And unwillingness to ask God for what we want. That might be, as our sister said, driven by pride. But when you think about it, it is an unwillingness to ask God for what we want. And the second one, asking God with the wrong motives, ineffective praying. If, you're, if your request to God is with selfish motives, then of course you're not praying properly. So here are two other drivers. Because, you know, the Bible says, the psalmist says that the Lord is the maker of heaven and earth. And, and Jesus said, ask, seek, knock. And yet, we refuse to do that. Two more drivers that the Apostle Paul has identified. And as we go on now to the other verse, verse 4 of James 4. Could somebody read this verse for us? James chapter 4, verse 4. Could somebody read this one for us? It's, it's on the screen. Daughter, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whatever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Sister Diane. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The apostle is still looking at the drivers, the causes, the source of the human condition. And the question that I have now is, why is friendship with the world enmity to God? Could someone share their perspective? Why do you think that the apostle has declared under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that friendship with the world is enmity to God? Can somebody say, share with us your perspective? But the word friendship is a good word. I think, you know, we are told that, you know, you cannot serve God and serve man. And, um, you know, ultimately, there is always that choice to be made. Who do you serve? Um, and so I'm taking from this question, that context. Um, and so to me, you know, when I look at this, this is what I think of. I think that, you know, you know, while friendship is good, um, you know, you're not going to receive the approval of everyone in the world. You can't possibly, and to receive approval of everyone in the world could possibly mean that you're not following in God's ways. And that's my opinion. Thank you, my sister Donna. Thank you so much. And I would want to, us to, to look at what the Apostle John had to say about this. And I want someone to read the passage that he put up. Because the Apostle John explains this whole matter of friendship with the world, making you an enemy and hostile toward God. First John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Could I have a reader? The passage is on the screen. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God continues to live forever. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Sister Jean. 
my brothers and sisters, friends all, notice how the Apostle John has unpacked this whole friendship and love of the world. And I want to ask, does anyone see a common thread in what the Apostle John is saying here as the drivers of the enmity between someone who loves the world and enmity with God. Do you see a common thread of the drivers of the human condition in First John here and James chapter 4? Do you see it? Um, Brother Daniel, I think the underlying thread is selfishness. Yes. Do you see anything else? It is in red on the screen. Lost. Lost. Is the very same thing that was mentioned in James chapter 4. But notice here, notice that the lost is broken down. Lost of the flesh. And that would be anything that has to do with our physical and, and that, that, that is not only sexual, can be um, in terms of even in terms of food. There are some people who eat themselves to death. The loss of the eyes, that is what we see, what we want, and we can't have, so we steal and we kill in order to get it. And the third driver, the boastful pride of life. Brothers and sisters, lost, and I like the definition, desire out of control, and notice pride, which is the opposite of humility. So as we continue our study, I want us to think about that. And as we continue through James 4, verses 5 and 6, we hear the apostle as he writes, or do you think that the scripture says to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit whom he has made to dwell in us, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. James 4, 5 through 6. And my brothers and sisters, the apostle is now hinting at God's solution. For the human condition. But before we go there, do we notice that the two words in red, it says in verse 6, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, right? But gives grace to the humble. And I want us to notice here, and I want to make it very simplistic. There are two types of people in the world. Two types, the proud and the humble. And the question that I am now going to float on the screen is not for us to answer out loud, but for us to answer within ourselves and with God, as I must answer for myself. If we have two types of people in the world, the question is, what type of a person are you? What type of a person are you? And my brothers and sisters, I would hazard to say, bear with me, pardon me. I think for most of us, including myself, we are basically proud persons. Humility is not something that comes naturally to the human person if we're honest with ourselves. But as I said before, here is where the Apostle now is beginning to share God's solution for the human condition. But before we get into the second part of James 4, we need to settle some definitions. And I need you to help me now, because with any Bible study, the Bible teacher does not have all the answers. And I want to let us see how we can jointly 
unpack and discover God's treasures in his words. So the first definition that we need to settle is, what is pride? Can I hear from someone? What is your definition of this thing that you call pride? What is pride? Don't be shy. What is pride? Um, you consider yourself the best thing since sliced bread. You're bumptious, facetious. Then, yes, yes. You, heard, you heard what I said? No, I was, I know. Oh, oh, sorry. I was saying that you think you believe that you are the best thing since sliced bread. You're bumptious, obnoxious, and as far as you're concerned, whatever you say goes, everything is. I, I, me, me. <laughs> Sister Diane says, pride is ex uh, someone, uh, someone who is full of pride thinks that they are the best thing since sliced bread. They are bumptious, <laughs> whatever. They, I, I rather like that. Do we have any other definition of the word pride? Um, Brother Donovan, they are prideful people who are quiet you know, and not bumptious. But just how they relate to people, the pride is very evident, quietly evident. Okay. Any other definition? I'm going to share two with you. Anybody else want to attempt? There's one in the chat. Could, could, um, Jackie, could you read the one in the chat or mix it? Sure. An inflated belief in self. Sometimes it's quiet sometimes noisy wonderful. wonderful so if you were to sum it up then you could put it this way an inflated opinion of ourselves that's pride or i like this definition thinking too much of yourself and too little of others thinking too much of yourself and too little of others Let's look at another definition now. What is humility? My mother of blessed memory used to say this, that humility is the mark of the uh, Christian. But can someone share, what is your, what would, what would be your definition of the word humility? And no answer is a silly answer. Share with me, brothers and sisters. What is humility before we get into the rest of that report? Abasing yourself. Basing yourself. Thank you, baby. Do we have any other? Basing yourself. Yeah, that's a good, good one. Well, as Paul says in Romans, thinking of yourself with sober judgment. Wonderful, sister. Jean. Thinking of abasing yourself, thinking of yourself with sober judgment. I like those, are very good. And I want to add three other definitions just to help us to understand this matter of humility. In the scriptures, the word means, among other things, as has been said earlier, to, to bring low. It also means a willingness to take the lower seat. A willingness to take the lower seat. But there's a definition that I love that I first heard from Bob Gass in the world for today. Another definition of humility and it goes like this. It is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. It is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. I'd rather like that one. And the third word, that we need to define before we can conclude our study and look at the rest of chapter four is the word submission. What is submission, brothers and sisters? And this is a word that a lot of people have problems with. So let me hear from you tonight. What do you understand by the meaning of the word submission? Can you understand? My method of presentation is not one that I'm lecturing to. But one where we'll both collectively 
try to honor the treasures and the gems in God's word. What is submission? Can someone share with us? Um, I think submission could be giving priority to others' thoughts and opinion ahead of yours. Okay. If you're using it in terms of um, in that context, it could fit any other definition and all of them. Have an issue with this? So I should hear some definition. I have Jean. Jean says yielding right away. Yielding right. Yielding. Yielding, yielding right away. Yielding right away. Of yielding. Way. Right yielding of way. Of way. Yeah. Like right. when you come to us, stop saying. Okay. And I see where Marcia. Marcia, yeah. you want to share a definition of submission? I see where Marcia's mic Yeah, I, sorry. Yes. I was thinking letting go, a surren surrendering of. I guess I'll stop at surrendering, you know, sort of letting go and recognizing dependence on God. But I guess that's too much, just sort of surrendering. Thank you so much. I think we're getting a basic sense. I just want to add a few definitions. And the classic dictionary definition is to accept or yield to a superior. That is the classic dictionary definition. But I like the, the definition from scripture, from the original language. If you look at it, it means to, to place under in an orderly fashion. That's what the word means in the original language, to place under in an orderly fashion. So if we take the matter of submission in the workplace, it does not mean that the manager is more than the subordinate. They are all equal. But it means that in order for the, for the organization to function, then to place on in an orderly fashion, it means someone has to take the lead if a decision has to be taken, and so, and some others have to follow. So submission does not necessarily mean in the, in, the, in the human context. For example, in a marriage, a lot of men misunderstand, a lot of women misunderstand. When, when the scriptures say, uh, wives submit to your husband, it does not mean that the husband and the wife are not equal. But in order to place on an orderly fashion for any organization to work and the family unit is an organization that is how it is set up because the scriptures do go on to say that we must submit one to another so there are instances where if you are a husband and your wife has a better idea you should be big enough to submit and say honey we will do it your way so submission to accept or yield to a superior or to place under in an orderly fashion. I just wanted to just clarify that. So this chapter now moves and begins to, to focus a major way in looking at the matter of submission and humility. And I believe that the rest of the chapter looks at the role of submission and humility in restoring the human condition. And I'd like to, to really encapsulate and to caption this section of the study as a roadmap for restoration, a roadmap for restoration. And as we go through James chapter four, let us now look at the roadmap for restoration that the Apostle James, under the inclusion of the Holy Spirit, outlines for us if we are to conquer the human condition. And James 4, verse 7, the first step in the roadmap, submit, therefore, to God. Submit, therefore, to God. The first step for the roadmap for restoration. And I want to declare 
that submission to God is the first step. Can anyone share with us? Why do you think submission to God is the first step for restoration? Why do you think that submission to God is the first step for restoration for the human condition? Do we have any takers? If you think about it, our sister sitting at Chapel in doing the invocation for the Bible study started by declaring that God is the sovereign of the universe. He is in charge of the galaxies. So my brothers and sisters, we think about it. And the scientists tell us that the galaxies, the universe is expanding as we speak. And that's why they know that the universe was created. And if you think about it, if we are just a nano speck of dust, don't you think it would be a good thing if we, if we are seeking restoration from the human condition that submission to God should be the first step? I put it to you. It is the basis or foundation for all other acts of submission. Be it submission to the government, to your employer, submission to your husband, wife, and as the scripture says, submission to each other. Submit one to another. Submission to God is the first step and is the basis and foundation of all other acts of submission. And I put it to you, unless we are prepared to submit to God, the human condition will not be changed in our own personal lives and as a country, as a society, as a world. Thirdly, all acts of submission to any lawful authority is ultimately a submission to God. Because he's a sovereign. He's the king of the universe. So a lot of people, you know, they think that submission is a bad word. But submission to any lawful author is ultimately submission to God. Romans 13, 1, 2, and 2. I'm going to flash it up on the screen. Could we have a reader for this verse from Romans? Quickly. Every person is to be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Sister Teacher. Okay. That was the first step. The second step. For the road for restoration. James 4 7. But resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, this one I, I, am, I, I will have to ask. Can anyone share why do you think this is the second step in the road for restoration? In fact, verse 7 begins by saying, Submit to God. This is the second half of the sentence. But resist the devil and will flee from, from you. Why do you think this is a second step in the roadmap for our restoration? Can anybody see why? Why what is the is the connection? I think because you can't be um, submitting to God and still continuing to pursue lusts and desires and all those things you know those things you know need to be resisted against as thank you are submitting to god thank you my sister thank you so much because the second step the second step following submission to god is because you become an enemy to satan because the world system jesus said the prince of the world Satan is the prince of the world, and he has set it up on the basis of selfishness and greed and lust and envy. 
and therefore if you're going to submit to God, then you have to resist those things. The second step following submission to God is because we become an enemy to Satan. And we need to understand here, I remember of Reverend Thomas to a point in this ocean, only a submitted believer can rule the devil. If you are not submitted to God, we are no match for Satan. It's important. So if we're going to, and sometimes the condition that we find in our families, if we are going to be the agents of restoration and change, we have to submit to God. That's why the apostle said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. And sometimes it might be someone in your family. It might be a wayward son on drugs or a spouse who is an alcoholic. Or it might be someone at the workplace. But the Bible says you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And sometimes it is the spirit behind that person. And that's why it's important for us to submit to God if we are going to be successfully resist and rout the enemy. The third step, verse eight, chapter four, come close to God and he will come close to you. Come close to God and he will come close to you. Can anyone see why this is an important third step? on the roadmap for restoration. Do we see it? Why does the word of God tell us that we need to come close to God? We need to come close to you. When you de develop a relationship with God, you become so much like him so that all his qualities will come out of you as you live in the world. Thank you, Sister Pat. Thank you so much. And I also want to add to what Sister Pat saying by putting it this way. The third step following submission to God is coming close to him, drawing near to him, because we are called to an intimate relationship, not a regime. We're not submitting to a military ruler, a dictator. The submission is one between a father and his children. Come close to God, draw near to God, the, the King James Version says, and he will draw near to you. It's because we are called to an intimate relationship. And if we are going to be agents of change, agents of healing, agents of restoration, we have to draw close to the source, to the power. Drawing near to God results in him drawing near and drawing close to us. The Bible, God is a gentleman, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He will never force himself on you. And that's why Revelation 3, I think 20 says that behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone open the, the door, I will come into him and we will come in and sup with him. So drawing close to God results in him drawing close to us. The scriptures tell us that if we seek God with all our hearts, then we shall find him. When you are close to God, it's a, it's a place of power. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. This is why this is a very important step. If we, we can't be restored, if we are removed from us, we're not seeking to build that intimate relationship with the one who is the restorer, the savior, the salvation. The, the, he's the one who is our salvation. Now the fourth step in on the road to restoration, Imps 4, 8, B and 9. It says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. This one is a tricky one. 
But if you think about it, it is an important step that we must take if we are to be restored. If you think about it, why is it important? And notice that I put two words in um, red. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded. Can anyone see why this is an important step on the road to restoration? Be miserable and mourning and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning. And you shall the moon. Is it not true, brothers and sisters, that if we are going to be restored, we have to live right? We have to live right. And notice what the apostle has, he has used. He said, cleanse your hands. What do our hands symbolize? What do they signify? Our hands is what we use to give, to receive. That's what we use to make payment, to receive. This is our dealings with each other. We use our hands. And what does the heart signify? Cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. That's our motive. So if it is that we are going to start the road for restoration, then we have to have clean hands. We can't be stealing from our employer. We steal with our hands. We have to be physical hands enough. These days we can steal digitally. The hands relate to our dealings with each other. Hmm? And the heart relate to our motive. So what, the, what, what God is saying here, if we are going to be restored, we have to be right. So you can't have God in one hand and the devil in the other. We can't say we are believers, but we are living in a relationship that we have no business to be in. Right? In an illicit relationship or we are doing underhand business. And we must repent. We must turn from our sins. And as verse 9 said, be miserable and mourn. And we let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. We need to be genuinely repentant and sorry for the things that we know that we have done that we ought not to have done. The scripture says that God commands men and women everywhere to repent. And the word repentance means to make a right about turn. You're heading in one direction and you start to head in the other direction. This is an important step on the roadmap for restoration. We have to start living right. We have to repent. And there are too many, too many who profess to be Christians, who their hands are not clean. Their dealings with others are not honest and their hearts are not pure or motives. And now we come to verse 10. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. This now is an important step. Can anyone? Here, why do you think that this is outlined in the word of God as an important step for all restoration? Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. Does anyone want to share why you think this is important? Lessons in submission and humility. Why is this an important step on the roadmap for restoration? Um, I think, Brother Danny, that when we humble ourselves, we acknowledge that we cannot do things on our own. We acknowledge that God is the, our director, our help. And we acknowledge that we will have to depend on him for life and for sustenance and everything that we need to live. 
And so this position of humility represents that recognition, that acceptance of who God is in our lives. Thank you, Sister Jackie. I could not have said it better. And I want to add to what my sister said by indicating that humility is the right attitude, is the wise attitude, is the sensible attitude, because Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. If God does not lend us our next breath, we are no longer here. It is the right attitude. And I want to just put up on the screen Micah verse 6. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly. Live right, to love mercy, right relationships, and to walk humbly with your God, right attitude. And my brothers and sisters, if you think about it, God came as a human being and he washed his disciples' feet. When I think about it, it blows my mind. And he said, you know, he said, and Peter was objecting, Lord, you won't wash my feet. And he said, well, if, if, if I can't wash your feet, you'll have no part of it. And then Peter said, well, wash all of it. He said, no, only your feet is necessary. And he said, go and do it all likewise. And you think about it. In Philippians chapter 2, it says that we should, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Um, Brother Danny Jean has her hands raised. Sister Jean? Yes, da Danny, in commenting on Micah 6 8, um, you said two things before. You said the right attitude. Do you mind repeating them? Yes. And what does the Lord require of you to act justly? That's right living. Hold on, right living? Yes, mm -hmm. to act justly, right living, and to love mercy, right relationships. Thank you. Walk, Got it. And Thank to you walk so much. Only with your God, right attitude. Attitude. Thank you. And, you know, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll, I'll give you rest. And he said, learn of me, because I'm humble and gentle in heart. Can you imagine the sovereign king and God of the universe declares, I'm humble in heart. This is the right attitude. Not that you think less of yourself, but you think less, you know. So you have to remember that. But I want to point out some other things about Humble humility, humble yourself in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. There are two other benefits of humility. Remember what James 4 said earlier. It's not only the right attitude, but it is the, it's the way to God's grace. Earlier in James chapter 4, he said, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the man. And grace is God's undeserved favor. Unmerited favor. Humility is not only the way to God's grace, it's also the way to exalt it. In God's economy, the way up is down. If you want to be promoted, you humble yourself in the presence of the Lord. Humble yourselves in your dealings with others, and God will promote you and exalt you because then He will see. That you have the right attitude to handle promotion and power. Humility is important. But now, as we wind down, could we have a reader for these verses in chapter four quickly? Could somebody read the verses quickly for us? Do not speak against one another, brothers and sisters. The one who speaks against a brother or a sister 
or judges his brother or sister, speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you judging your neighbor? James 4. Thank you, Beth. Why is our speech an important step in our restoration? My brothers and sisters, our speech is important in our restoration because it is a fluid for our relationships. No wonder the Proverbs say, a, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Do you know how many people have been murdered in this country because of something that somebody said and they feel that somebody dissed me? Show me disrespect. Our speech is a fuel for our relationships. What we say and about to each other, what we say about and to each other will affect our relationship with one another. And so this is an important step on the road for restoration. We have to mind how we speak. And so we have to ensure that our speech is wholesome. That it, it builds up. If you don't have something good to say about somebody, don't say. We can correct you, even rebuke. But with love. And the scriptures tell us, speak the truth in love. And sometimes you are saying the right thing, but it is not received because you are saying it in the wrong way, with the wrong spirit. And that's why the scriptures said that the servant of God is not quarrelsome, but gentle, apt to teach. So refrain from judging others and reserve all judgments. To Our speech is important. And my brothers and sisters, we come now to the last two verses of chapter 4. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow, for you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So for one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, for him it is sin. Why is this important on the roadmap for restoration? Why is this important? And we do this all the time, don't we? It is important because life is unpredictable. You don't know when you go to your bed, when you wake up tomorrow. Because life is unpredictable. Live accordingly. And Psalm 90, written by Moses, says, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom, that we may live wisely. So, because life is unpredictable, live accordingly. Do not boast about tomorrow, because we don't know what tomorrow is going to be. And my brothers and sisters, how many of us would know? that death changes things. If you're in a family, the passing of a loved one unexpectedly can change your entire life. So let us be humble and seek to live according to the will of God. If God wills you, God willing you, I will be here. So my brothers and sisters, we have come to the end of our study. 
And I just want to summarize the, the, the steps on the roadmap for restoration for the human condition. Submit to God, first step. For without God, we can do nothing. Resist the devil and he will flee. We have an enemy of our souls. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's a place of restoration. It's a place of shelter. It's a place of direction. It's a place of guidance. It's a place of power. And you can only build your relationship with God if you spend the time to draw near to him. Live right. Do not continue to walk in sin. And for heaven's sake, humble yourself before God and with others. Do not speak evil or badmouth others. It is a seed of contention and quarreling and resentment. Do not be arrogant and boastful because we are just a day from. And remember that tomorrow is promised to no one. My brothers and sisters, James chapter 4. Do you have any questions or anything that you think that I did not mention that you want to mention? Any, any area of clarification? Now is the time. What a lovely chapter. And what I like about it, it deals with the issue. Do we have any questions? I see Dr. Brother James has his hand up. So James, you can go ahead and exactly where you Yes, but yes, brother Donna and everybody on the platform. A very pleasant evening. I'm listening to your presentation and I am very delighted and thrilled with your presentation. Get some better understanding about certain perspective. But we are living in a world where I've seen all of these things happening. All of these things are happening. It's happening to persons who are believers in Christ and persons who are not believing in Christ. So my question is, why is it that why is it that we are so easy to fall into this kind of default behavior? We're bad mouth, arrogant, bossy, you know what I mean? Not humble. And all these things that we are seeing in the Bible that we should, that we should, we should as believers, this is the characteristics. These, this is the way we should behave. But it is so difficult, it is so challenging for believers to really demonstrate these things on a daily basis because it appears to me that we are pressured by the forces of the world. So what we tend to do is to conform to what is happening in the world around us. Easy for a Christian to conform, easy for believers to conform. And... Uh, not realizing that we should, as you rightly say in the Bible, flee the devil, flee the devil, flee the devil. So, Brother Danny, help me with that, please. Well, I would want to say, Brother James, that the difficulty that I find that many believers are having in terms of their own walk and living a victorious life, it begins with step number one. We have to submit to God. We have to surrender to him and we have to seek to draw near to him. Romans chapter 1 says, you know, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you know, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual worship. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But a, a lot of us, we are not spending enough time drawing close to God. We don't spend enough time in God's presence. We don't spend enough time praying. We don't spend enough time in his word. So our lives are powerless. You can't if you are not connected with the source of power. Jesus said, abide in me. And let my words abide in you. And you will bear much fruit. And I think that we, we can find time for everything else. 
be it social media, be it WhatsApp, answering our Facebook, our messenger. But when it comes to spending time with God, I think this is where we need to focus on. If we're going to surrender and submit to God, we have to spend time. That's why we are powerless. And if you ask brothers and sisters, how, many how much time do we spend in reading God's word? Which is a source of direction, is a source of power. But we spend, we spend a lot of time reading the Dino. Not, not that we shouldn't read it. But we need to, God told Joshua, you know, when he took over from Moses, he said to him, meditate on the word day and night and make sure to do everything we can hear him. Then you shall find your way successful and you shall prosper. So I think, brothers and sisters, this is where we need to focus. As Bishop Harold Daniel says, you should make an appointment with God every day. Make sure before you start the day, you make an appointment. Some people, our appointment is with our WhatsApp Con contact. Make an appointment with God. Present yourself and say, Lord, as our liturgy says, um, Lord, I give this day to you. Lord, thank you for giving me a new day. Thank you for a measure of health. Lord, I present my body. I present my life, my work, all of my ways. I give it to you. And sometimes you might have to say, Lord, help my ungive, my unwillingness to give it to you. Lord, I believe, help out my unbelief. And as our sister Lee Twiz on the platform would that say, can you say to the Lord, Lord, organize my day for me today. And you read the word, use a devotional. You're going through a chapter in the Bible. And this is where we will find power. Draw near to God. You'll draw me to you. So I hope, Brother James, that those few words you'll find helpful. Yes, Brother Danny. Spot on, Brother Danny. Thank you very much for the explanation. Thing that says the devil will flee from you. Yeah. It is my experience that the, it's not a one-off thing. In my experience, I probably, I know I need to grow a lot more, but the devil, in my experience, has a way, just like how when Jesus was being tested in the wilderness, the devil left him for a while. I find, and if I'm wrong, I, I need to be corrected and I, I'm open to it, that the devil comes back. Time and time again, sometimes when you least expect, even after you have gone through and you submitted and you're going through a period of grace. And that is when out of nowhere, the devil seems to marshal his forces and come again at you. So I am saying, yes, the devil will flee. But I think we need to be on guard. At least I know I need to be on guard. Because he comes back sometimes in a more wily guise. Sometimes through someone you least expect. Because in friendship you are submitting yourselves to them. So I, I just want to have you speak to that, that the, the devil does not just flee from you once and for all, never to return. That is an ongoing, I find it's an ongoing struggle that you have to keep always actively engaged in this close relationship in order to find the strength to yes. fight him off. So please tell me if I'm wrong. Jesus is the pattern and Jesus was tempted and he was in the wilderness for 40 days and he says that the devil left him for a season. For so a season, yes. Left him for a season. So it is true 
But and you must remember that Peter, the Apostle Peter, said that we must be on guard for our adversary the devil walketh about as a roaring man seeking whom he may devour. But what we should draw from James chapter 4 is this submit to God and the devil will flee from you. What we need to draw, submission is a lifestyle. It is a it is a lifestyle. You 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 if you're going to be successful. You can't be submitted to God today and not tomorrow. If you are submitted to God as a lifestyle, then even when he comes back, you will be ready. You will have your armor put on and you'll have the word of God, the sword of the spirit, and the shield of faith to quench the fire of God. So the important thing is submit yourselves to God, as Romans 12 says. But it should be our daily prayer, living sacrifice every morning. Lord, help me to give my body, my soul to you, my heart, my mind, as a living sacrifice, my life, my work, all of my ways. That should be your prayer. And you will be ready when he comes back. And brother and sister, I think I am out of time. Sister Selena, hope, hope that helps you. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, bro Brother Danny, um, just a quick, quick one from G.H. Davidson, who is questioning how do you balance between sinful pursuits and things like personal pursuits to win jobs, bids, promotions. How do you get that delicate balance between those personal pursuits and possible sinful pursuits? I will say this quickly. Always remember that if you are submitted to Almighty God, then it means he's the captain of your life. He's the leader of your life. He's the Lord. He's the boss. So there's nothing wrong with desires. The Bible says that if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. So you put those ambitions to the Lord and ask him to lead and to purify and to clarify. And as you do that prayerfully, Making sure, remembering that whatsoever you do on this earth, you have to do it as unto the Lord, not unto yourself. And if you can remember that, and you put your ambitions, your desires, the Lord, I'd like this, and you put it and say, Lord, lead you in the arm way. This is what I would want. If it is, Lord, open the door. If it is not, close the door. I think if we can do it like that, we can manage that delicate balance. Okay? Hope that helps. So I'm handing back over to you, Jackie. Thank you, Brother Danny. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the close of another interesting Bible study, a very practical Bible study. And before we go into the closing song, Make Me a Servant, I just wanted to mention two things. That the Bible says, the scripture is like a mirror that when we read it we see ourselves so we do need some introspection this evening and danny has carried us through that and i want us not to forget not to forget that we need to look at ourselves and it is through the scripture it is through the scripture that we do that but also importantly if we are to be true servants of God, we must epitomize humility and submission. And so, Danny, I want to thank you for this evening's presentation. And may we always remember James 1 verse 22, be doers of the word and not hearers only. So thank you, Danny. Thank you. And also to thank everyone who has participated. We really appreciate it. And I know that those who did not ask questions still appreciated and picked up something from the session. And so we're moving into the closing song that says, make me a servant. Make me a song.
I think that was the perfect song to close this evening's Bible study. And before I ask Brother Danny to do the benediction, may I remind you that next week we will be closing the series and the focus will be James chapter 5. Our presenter then will be Sister Heather Lynn and she'll be looking at advice on wealth, suffering, and prayer. Now that sounds like an interesting combination. And so I invite you all to come back next week, same time, same place to participate in another interesting lesson from James on spiritual maturity. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Danny, again. Thanks again for the team for putting all this together. We really do appreciate your time and effort. And so, Danny, I'm going to ask you now to close us off with the benediction. Thank you, Sister Jackie. Let us know. Father, we thank you, Lord, for loving us so much that in spite of the condition that we find ourselves in, a broken world, with so much conflict, war, and malice, and strife, and murders, that you have provided a roadmap for us for restoration. Grant us the grace, Lord. Bless the words of this book, this chapter. Write it on the tables of our hearts, Lord, and help us, Lord. Give us the grace to humble ourselves before you, and the grace, Lord, to submit. Help us, Lord, to yield ourselves to you, Lord that you may transform us, that you may become agents of transformation for others. May Jesus be seen in us and through us. And in the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we will us all, now and always. Amen and Amen. And everyone says, Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful amen. night. And we will see you all next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie.